So recently, you might have heard a lot about so-called deep networks or neural networks or deep learning architectures. What are these and how did they come about? We'll talk about this starting from the beginning of so-called neural network research and tracing it to where it has gotten to today. Modern neural network research can be traced back to the psychologist Donald Hebb in the 1940s. Donald Hebb proposed that s networks of simple units following very simple learning rules can learn to understand and model very complicated patterns. And the simplest rule that he proposed is just if two units are active at the same time, make the network connection between them a little bit stronger, and if they're not active at the same time, make it a little bit weaker. So this was largely inspired by his ideas about biological neurons and how they might learn patterns. And since then, we've actually found that biological neurons do carry out some of these simple rules. These rules that Donald Hebb proposed are today called Hebbian learning. They're a little bit different than what's used in supervised learning. They play a bigger part in unsupervised learning, so we won't talk in depth about them. But this was the beginning of our conception of neural networks, which are models of simple units that are connected to each other and that learn by changing the weights between the units. Now, the modern neural network really arose with the work of Frank Rosenblatt, who was another psychologist and who in the 1950s invented what he called the perceptron. The perceptron was a computational model of learning and it was already a supervised architecture so it could learn to predict patterns that were given to it and it, Frank Rosenblatt in the 50s demonstrated that he could train the uh, perceptron to recognize simple patterns like letters. And this generated actually a lot of excitement at the time because this is pretty unprecedented in AI research. So how does a perceptron work? Well, a perceptron consists, like I said, of several simple units, which are called neurons or nodes. And in this diagram, we see the essential layout. So the, here, there's two so-called input neurons, which I've labeled x1 and x2. Now, if we remember our previous discussion of uh, classifying something like images of dogs and cats, and we plotted them in two dimensions, these two dimensions would be the numbers that are fed into x1 and x2. But of course that means that we can have many more inputs. We could have thousands of inputs if we wanted. For conceptual reasons, we'll keep it as simple as possible. So we have two input neurons, x1 and x2. These are combined using something called a weighted sum. So essentially, for each of these neurons, there's a weight and the neuron can have a certain value and we multiply that value by the weight and then we sum them together. That's, you see that in the blue circle. And after that, the weighted sum is passed through something called a nonlinearity. Now a nonlinearity is just a nonlinear function and what the perceptron uses is called a threshold nonlinearity and it basically says if the weighted sum is below some threshold, output a zero. And if it's above some threshold, output a 1. So it's like a cutoff. Now, the learning algorithm for perceptrons involves adjusting the weights here, weight 1 and weight 2, and actually also the threshold B, so as to learn a certain uh, mapping from the input neurons to 0 or 1 outputs, which could be, for example, cat or dog. From now on, I'll represent the weighted sum and the nonlinearity as a combined neuron in this greenish blue color. And this will show up in later slides. Now, if you remember before, I discussed how in supervised learning, we have some training data set that has, for example, uh, inputs from two classes, although it could be more classes, but to keep it simple, two classes. And we learn a surface that separates inputs from one class and the other class. Now this kind of perceptron that you see here, this surface is a line. And we know it's a line if you remember a little bit from uh, high school geometry because a weighted sum essentially defines a line. 
So in this case, we have a weighted sum, and then we check whether it's above or below the threshold. And this actually creates this linear separating surface where everything on one side of the line belongs to class 1, let's say, and everything on the other side of the line belongs to class 0. And we, using the perceptron training algorithm, we can actually learn the kinds of separating surfaces that you see here, where the training data set is represented by plus as being one class and minus as being the other class. Even though the perceptron comes from the 50s, it actually has almost all the ingredients of a modern neural network. And so all the research that has come since has built on this basic architecture. An important development in the field of neural network research happened in 1969 when two AI pioneers, Minsky and Pappard, published a book called The Perceptrons. Now, they were very interested in the idea that Frank Rosenblatt proposed, and so they did a lot of mathematical and theoretical analysis of the perceptron. However, one result that they proved essentially killed neural network research for 20 years. And what they proved was that the kind of perceptron that we saw in previous slide could not learn to recognize certain kinds of patterns. Now, you might already have some idea of the kinds of patterns it might not be able to recognize, but again, it's easy to see visually. As I said before, for the perceptron, the separating surface is always a line. Now, if you're provided with a training data set, like the one you see in the lower right hand corner of your screen, with members of the plus and minus class arranged as they are, there's simply no way to separate the pluses and the minuses using a single line. And this kind of problem is called a non-linearly separable problem because the members of the different classes can't be separated by a single line. Since the perceptron can only learn linear separating surfaces, there's no way this kind of perceptron could learn to properly classify pluses and minuses arranged in this way. At the same time, this class of problems, the non-linearly separable ones, occurs in many cases. It occurs whenever elements of one class have either one thing or the other thing, but not both. And clearly that occurs in many situations and we would like machine learning to be able to learn patterns like that. So this was a big issue for perceptrons and people lost interest in them and thought that they couldn't really do many interesting things. Now the situation changed dramatically in mid 1980s when two cognitive scientists, Ramahud and McClelland, published a book called Parallel Distributed Processing. Now, you saw in the previous case the, the simplest form of the perceptron. We have two inputs or some number of inputs that have a weighted sum and a nonlinearity, and that's the output. What parallel distributed processing discussed was perceptrons, or more broadly, neural networks, in which there's many nested layers. So there's a, there's a set of input neurons. These get summed and passed through nonlinearity. But then there's multiple of these sums and nonlinearities, and these sums and nonlinearities now serve as the inputs for the next layer. So they them, their outputs are themselves summed and passed through another nonlinearity, and so on. In this diagram, you see a multi-layer neural network where there's the input layer, the inputs go to two different sums and nonlinearities, and those then go to yet a further sum and nonlinearity. And we call the uh, sums and nonlinearities in the middle, in this case, a hidden layer. What parallel distributed processing showed is that you could design such multi layer neural networks, that there is a very efficient, computationally efficient learning rule that could train the weights of these multi layer neural networks, and that these multi layer neural networks could learn. Uh, patterns like non-linearly separable problems. In fact, there's results showing that with enough hidden units and hidden layers, they could learn any function at all in the world. Here we'll see how multi-layer neural networks can actually solve something like a non-linearly separable problem, which was such an issue for the single layer perceptron. So we know that each of the individual weighted sums and nonlinearities essentially defines a linear separating surface. So we can think of each of the weighted sums and nonlinearities in the hidden layer as setting up their own linear separating surfaces. So here, the top one, for example, will say that class one is everything above and to the left of the red line, and the bottom one would say that class one is everything to the bottom and right of the shifted red line. 
Now, interestingly, we can represent an intersection as a weighted sum passed through nonlinearity. Imagine setting both of the incoming weights to 1, and then saying if the weighted sum is less than 2, output is 0, and if it's 2 or greater than 2, output a 1. That means that the very output neuron will only turn on if both of the input neurons are turned on. So essentially, that's like taking the intersection of the class 1 uh, regions of both of the hidden layers. And in this case, it's exactly what's needed to solve the nonlinearly separable problem and separate the minuses from the pluses in the nonlinearly separable example we saw before. Now, as I mentioned, the original perceptron used something called a threshold nonlinearity, which basically turns from a 0 to a 1 as soon as the weighted sum input passes a certain threshold. In modern neural network algorithms, and including the ones that were used in the, starting from the 80s, we used a differentiable nonlinearity, meaning that it's a smooth function, and we can take, take its derivative and minimize the training error by essentially using the derivatives of the functions that are transforming our signals. This sounds complicated, but it's pretty easy to think about visually. If we think about some function, such as the training error, defined over uh, the values of the weights uh, that are define the connections in our network, then this training algorithm essentially tries to roll down the hill and change the weights so as to minimize the training error. And because we have derivatives, we know which way to roll. This set of algorithms broadly that follow the derivatives down so as to minimize training error little by little are called gradient descent algorithms. You might also hear very often in modern machine learning terms like stochastic gradient descent, SGD, which is a small variant of this basic idea. And this was very successful for training multilayer neural networks. I should also add that one reason it was successful was because there was a certain trick that was discovered to do gradient descent on neural networks. If you just want to compute which way you should change the weight so as to minimize training error for a large neural network, it's actually a very computationally difficult problem. You might also hear the term backpropagation or backprop, which is essentially a very computationally quick way to do gradient descent, and that became widely used in the 1980s and made neural networks practical to train. Now, starting from the mid-80s and through uh, 2010 or so, neural networks generated a lot of excitement among psychologists and cognitive scientists. They actually seem to be quite good models of human perceptual performance and various kinds of uh, uh, behaviors that people do in psychological tasks. However, for actual machine learning applications, they just weren't very good. They weren't at the state of the art and other algorithms tended to perform better than neural networks did at uh, applied tasks like recognizing images and dis determining whether it's a cat or dog, for example. And because of this, there was a kind of winter of applied neural network research that lasted for almost two decades, or maybe even a little bit more, where people did not take neural networks very seriously as state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms. This changed dramatically in the early 2010s, and particularly, there was a kind of dramatic explosion of interest in neural networks in 2012. So I should add that on a yearly basis, there's many competitions in the uh, machine learning academic community where different groups try to crack machine learning problems and they compete with each other based on how well their algorithms do. Uh, there's been one competition in particular which involved classifying images according to what's shown in them. So we talked earlier about classifying images as either being a dog or a cat. This competition, which is called ImageNet, actually had thousands of classes. It had uh, classes, as you can see now in this slide, things like uh, leopard and mushroom and mite and uh, all kinds of stuff. So it's a much harder task. It's not just cat or dog. It has something like a thousand, on the order of a thousand classes. And the goal was to try to predict what class the image belonged to. Now, there had been some improvement in this task. Year on year, maybe the best performer improved by a percent or two. 
And in 2012, something very dramatic happened. For the first time, a neural network algorithm won first place in a competition, and it improved dramatically above any non-neural network entry. In particular, the neural network entry that was submitted and won first place beat by more than 10% error the next best entry, which got something like 25% error rather than 15. Now the next best entry, it used hand-coded features that were aimed to capture some important aspects of images and visual recognition. It used hand-tuned algorithms that have been in development for many, many years by some really smart people. But the neural network essentially started from scratch and learned to beat it by a lot. So pe this really shocked people that a neural network that was kind of a, a not domain specific, not really hand tuned, could do so well. In the next video, we'll discuss what it was that made the neural network do so well in this competition and really started what we might call the deep learning revolution that's going on right now.